I'd like to thank everybody for coming out, especially the panel. I think this is going to be a really interesting evening. Uh, the Transportation Board does this about once a year. We'll pick a topic and go in depth and bring people from outside, bring in an expert panel and discuss, discuss an issue more in depth rather than just uh, go through a laundry list of things. Uh, tonight, the issue that we're going to talk about is bicycle safety. And in Fort Collins, there's probably no more electric topic in terms of polarizing views. Um, it doesn't take much in any conversation in Fort Collins to find out where people sit on the issue, either pro-bike, anti-bike, pro-car, anti-car, um, and, uh, and those people are very, they, they hold fast to their views. Um, this is a very dynamic bicycle culture community, so we do have a lot of bicyclists here. That is per plan, and it's also nice that it's become part of our community. One of the things that comes with that, though, is uh, with the rise in numbers, you also have the potential to get a rise in incidents, and that's one of the things we want to talk about tonight. I'm very, very pleased to introduce to you the panel that we have tonight. Um, on, I'll start from the right-hand side of the audience. Uh, first speaker tonight is going to be Dr. Terry Marty from University of Colorado Health. Uh, Dr. Marty wrote an article probably a year ago in the Fort Collins, Colorado, about bicycle accidents. Uh, uh, safety and her, her research that she's done and we've been trying to get together over the course of this last year and we finally made everything work and it worked out well in a panel presentation. So I'm not going to steal any more of your thunder. I'll come back to you in just a moment, but thank you for coming. Uh, the second panelist is Joe Olson. Joe's the city's traffic engineer. Joe's been with us for six years and Joe is a phenomenal traffic engineer, has done a wonderful job in terms of his analytics, in terms of his ability to work with the bicycling community and really to find that middle ground and for the safety of the community. So I really appreciate him being here this evening. Next is Tessa Grieger. Tessa is the city's bike program coordinator. Um, Tessa's been with us a little over a year now and has done a phenomenal job. She's also heading up the new bicycle plan. Um, effort and that uh, will, I'm sure that'll be sprinkled in with her responses and her presentations this evening. Um, I, she's done a phenomenal job in terms of bringing analytics and good planning skills to, to bicycling in, to, in town. Um, Dr. Officer David Case uh, is joining us and um, to bring that, uh, that perspective for the panel because that's always one of the things that we always bring. Why don't the police fill in the blank? Either. <laughs> They, why, why don't they do more enforcement? Why don't they do less enforcement? I mean, it, so I think it's great that they're here, and we appreciate that, and I think that'll be a good discussion. And we had a late walk-on onto the panel. Um, Bruce Henderson is an old friend. Welcome back. Bruce actually was the chair of the Transportation Board back in 18, or 2000 and... <laughs> 2004, five, about then? I don't know. We're both, get, both getting old here, so. Yeah. And uh, Bruce is, are you the chair of Bike for Collins now? Uh, no, I'm the, I'm the chair of the advocacy committee of Bike for Collins. Great. Dot Dickerson is the chair of Bike Okay, Collins. well great. Well, it's great to have you back, and it's nice to have you back in this room too, so welcome. And then finally is Sylvia Cranmer. Sylvia is also an alum of the city and, and many, many, uh, many, many efforts, and she's the Bicycle Advisory Board Chair and she's going to bring that uh, perspective to us as well. We, the Transportation Board values the Bike Advisory Committee's input a great deal, and I think one of the things I want to do in the next year is really strengthen the ties that we have with that group, and let's bring them, those two together more. So what we'll do this evening is we've got a series of questions for each of the panelists. We'll go through. There'll be time for questions and answers. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand, and I'll bring the mic. That way it'll pick it up for the taping, and I'll bring it over to you. And um, there's nothing formal about tonight. We're just going to go through and we'll talk as long as people want to talk and are interested in listening. Um, and we'll just go into the topic and, and dive in. We've got questions for each of the people. And then if we have time or if you have questions at the end, we'll certainly will make time for that as well. Anything you want to dive into, you'll never get a, a more uh, deep bench in terms of the people we have here for you tonight. Ready to go? All right. Terry, we're going to start with you, if that's okay. Um, you've done a lot of research in the area of bicycle safety and crash statistics. Um, can you just, as your introduction, tell us a little bit about yourself, tell us a little bit about your research and, and your major findings, and, um, and what are your conclusions and recommendations? When I came to Fort Collins about eight years ago, I noticed, obviously, the cycling culture here. But also as a trauma surgeon, I noticed the number of injured cyclists that we treated at the hospitals 
on a very regular basis. So that's how I started uh, looking at our numbers. As a cyclist, parent, and physician, I really felt this was an area we needed to examine further and work closely with the city. So I appreciate my ability to be here tonight. Real quickly, um, when we looked into this, I was surprised that bicyclists and pedestrian fatalities are the top 10 mortality uh, worldwide. And it, by the next five years, will be the number third cause of death worldwide. This is both pedestrian and bicyclist. And on an annual basis, that's over a million fatalities. So I think this is a real important issue. This is data from the US National Highway Traffic Safety. And as we all know, most non-fatal injuries are collisions with trees, other bicyclists, curbs, et cetera. But fatal injuries are collisions with motor vehicles. And our data has, has really supported that as well. The graph at the bottom shows who's at fault in fatal injuries. The real younger population, I don't have a pointer, but the, the high blue bars are people under the age of 25. And you can see they're most often at fault. The middle bars, it's about 50-50, or m perhaps more s motorist. And as the older population above 55, it's 50-50 again, motorist and cyclist. These are headlines I cut out over a one to two week interval that just emphasize what we all know, that bikes are very important to the culture here. They have good and bad impacts, depending on what side of the fence you're on, as Mark alluded to. So what have we been doing uh, as far as research here at Poudre Valley and Medical Center of the Rockies over the past seven to eight years? Like I said, we have a large number of injured cyclists that we see on a daily or weekly basis. So we wanted to compare our numbers to the National Trauma Data Bank. And the reason for doing this is that we're a trauma center certified on a national level, and we need to help develop prevention strategies. So as a cyclist, um, I, I took this on as a, as a strong interest. Our trauma registry records all patients injured by any mechanism and attributed to bikes over the past seven to eight years we've had about two to three hundred this represents about 12 percent of our trauma patients at both hospitals combined and about a third of these patients need to be hospitalized here are the raw numbers you can see we probably had a peak one to two years ago and these numbers at the bottom for 2014 are only up until August 1st of this year. I can tell you in the last month of loan, we've had four auto bike accidents at Poudre Valley uh, and several other injured cyclists. So this number is going to obviously rise. These numbers are described graphically, so you can see a trend up. The numbers overall are pretty small, so if this is statistically significant, is really indeterminate. But I do think there's a trend up. Our population has grown over this time interval as well. These numbers here are very concordant with the national data. About three-fourths of the patients are men. The majority are fairly young. The accidents happen in the spring, spring and um, summer months. Fortunately, our mortality rate is about 1%. <coughs> the vast majority are Colorado residents. This surprised us because we do see a fair number of people that are really unfamiliar with the roads or steep inclines traffic, the trails, the altitude, and about a third of our patients were helmeted. About two-thirds of the injuries were what we classify as minor, meaning they could be treated and sent home from the emergency room, 25% moderate, 6% serious requiring intensive care unit admission, and then less than 1% immediately life-threatening. The injury pattern that we've seen is displayed here. The head and face those really represent our intoxicated, unhelmeted cyclists that we see quite frequently. We have twice as many upper extremity fractures as lower, and that is really opposite of the National Trauma Data Bank information. And why that is, we're still trying to determine that. The patients that are hospitalized, their average length of stay is about three days. This ranges anywhere from 12 hours to four weeks or longer. <coughs> The vast majority are able to go home, 10% rehab, about 1% jail or other facilities. Um, over the 
time interval, there have been uh, 10 fatalities treated at our two facilities. These data uh, do parallel the national data. The vast majority are very young men and about 40% wearing a helmet. The fatalities again spike the same time of the accidents, late summer and fall. 40% of the drivers, these were all motor vehicle collisions. Drivers were impaired either by alcohol, drugs, sun glare, texting, etc. 40% in the morning and 60% in the afternoon. This again is a real striking difference from national data. Uh, nationally, most fatalities occur in the late evening or midnight time. So we're a little different and again, we're trying to work on that as well. 20% before or after school. These are the two ghost bikes that have been placed in Fort Collins the past year to commemorate and raise awareness of this issue. One was near Front Range Community College. The other one, this other one here is on the frontage road. This is just to let you know that this issue's gotten a lot of attention on the national medical and surgical level by trauma surgeons, ortho surgeons. There's a lot of data in prevention, and I guess that's a whole different panel discussion, but really visibility, sobriety are, are paramount. Uh, helmets, again, I just wanted to show you these graphs because I thought they're interesting from a helmet lab. Also, I want to commemorate Fort Collins. This is a bike diploma from the early 60s, so this community has been on the forefront of this issue for many, many decades. Our country, though, has a long way to go. We only take about 1% of trips by bicycle, and our injury rate is much higher than European countries, which take 20% or more trips by bike. And this holds true if it's calculated per trip or per kilometer. And so this is just a summary, and that's why we're here tonight. So again, I appreciate your time and attention. I'm a member of the Coalition for Infrastructure. We've had a discussion about bike helmets, and one of the things we believe to be true is that as people not wear helmets, cars, I guess, believe they're, them to be unsafe and give them more uh, space when they pass them and stuff like that. So in a sense, it goes against the being safe, being unsafe, promote safety. What do you see in that trend? I think that's controversial. I think you can find articles and support on both sides of that. Because um, there's also data to show that if you're a cyclist wearing high visibility and a helmet, a car sees you as a cyclist that knows what they're doing and respects you, as opposed to someone without a helmet, they might think you as somewhat more erratic. Um, I just know I have a whole talk on helmets. I feel very strongly about that. Um, but I have heard what you're saying. Hi, my name's Josh Kerson. I've been with the Bicycle Advisory Committee here uh, years past. And my interest is in, from the injuries do you see, do you think that the uh, majority of them are at intersections? Perhaps uh, could you feel that uh, through the history of looking at it, you could say that it might be more so of people who ride on the left side of the road wrongly or or uh, pop off of sidewalks, you know, is there some sort of a trend like that that we could uh, see? We sometimes don't get the complete scene information, um, and I'm going to ask Joe Olson to also address this. I, I do think intersections are a high-risk area, but we haven't been able to correlate that completely because sometimes we don't get all the information, we just get the patients. So we actually, we get all the police crash reports, so we see a, a kind of a different set of data than Dr. Marty does, which is one of the reasons that I'm really excited that she's here and that we've been collaborating on some of these things because we're getting a bigger picture. We don't necessarily see the falls and the alcohol-related ones where people are wrecking their face because those don't involve a motor vehicle. And all of ours involve motor vehicles. And so we kind of have a subset of the total crash data. But in that subset of just motor vehicle bike crashes, about 80% of them occur at intersections. And so, yeah, like, like Dr. Marty said, intersections are a special concern. Uh, and, and it's because of, of the, the different movements and the different conflicts that may be unexpected. And part of that is attributable to wrong way riding. 
um, either on the street or even on the sidewalk and coming off the sidewalk into the street. So, yeah, it's absolutely an area of, of emphasis for us that we're looking at is, is when we're talking about trying to reduce crashes. I'm Ed Perrin, and I've uh, lived here for 22 years. I've been an avid cyclist the whole time since I got out of the military. Um, I do wear a helmet. Saved my life, I will say, last month. I'll be glad to show you a picture. Uh, but anyway, a question I have on some of these laws, breaking the laws, riding the wrong way. I know in drive, uh, when you're driving, sometimes they'll send you some sort of a driver's uh, training, post-driver's training. Is there anything like that available in the city that, you know, cyclists who are doing the wrong thing, that there's a classroom situation where, you know, it might be possible to, to send them to? So, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, so um, we've just launched a new uh, traffic safety diversion program in partnership with the municipal court. Um, we actually have our first course uh, next Friday. And so this is intended for people that have actually received some type of bicycle-related citation. Um, and then they'll come and um, they have the option to attend a free class, which is three hours long, um, which is modeled after our League of American Bicyclists Safe Cycling Program. Um, and then there's also an on bike, an optional on bike portion for people that want to actually get out in the street and kind of learn some of the basics of, of traffic laws and, and safe cycling. So, so we're pretty excited about that, that partnership and that, um, that new uh, course that we're offering. I know from League of American Bicyclists uh, data review of, of bicycle fatalities that they've found that 40% of those occur when the cyclist is hit from behind. How does that compare with local data? I think that that's very concordant with our, lo with our local data. Um, Joe, we're going to go to you next. Um, the state of bicycling in Fort Collins report confirms the total number of bicycle crashes has steadily increased over the past decade. If we're striving for a 20% bicycle mode share, does that automatically mean, can we expect to see more crashes? Does the concept safety and numbers apply? That is, that is a really interesting question for us, and it's something that we've been trying to uh, find some answers to. As you can see, this is, a, again, this is our subset of data, our motor vehicle bike crashes over the past uh, 14 years, and you can see the trend is upwards. And what we feel like is happening here is that our crashes are going up, but our bike volumes are going up as well. And so we almost feel like it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of a relationship that as the volumes go up, we're seeing more crashes. We don't have good bike exposure data. We don't have good bike volume data to be able to say for certain how, how accurate that relationship is. That's one of the things that we're working to collect. Tesla's working on some things as far as getting 24-hour volume, and then our traffic operations is also collecting counts at intersections to try to, to, try to get a better handle on our exposure uh, of bicyclists. Because really the question is, and what we keep hearing in kind of some of the national literature is that as volumes keep going up, there gets to be a tipping point where it starts to get safer. And so a lot of the things that we're trying to do as far as trying to encourage bicycling is with this idea that it's going to get safer as it goes along. Um, and, and depending on how you look at that, there's some truth to that. But um, there's been some recent research done. This was done at the University of Colorado Denver where they came up with a model of bike crashes versus volumes. And you can see here on the, on the, the, the horizontal axis this is your, your bike volumes, and this is your number of crashes. The way I set this up was, was over here where bike volumes are zero. That's assuming a kind of a typical signalized intersection where about the average vehicle volume is about 35,000 vehicles entering a day. And so this over here is zero bikes, 35,000 vehicles. Over here, this represents like a mode shift. So as these numbers go up to 5,000 bikes, it would be 30,000 vehicles, all the way over here to 35,000 bikes and zero vehicles. So this is truly that mode split. And this is the model that, that came out of that study at the University of Colorado or Denver. You can see that the tipping point here where crashes actually start to go back down would be where you'd get almost to 20,000 bikes and only 15,000 cars. We don't, we're not anywhere close to that anywhere. Um, and, you know, we're really more probably over here in this first area here where the, the steepness of the line, is, it's as, st you know, as, as steep as it goes. And so at least in the foreseeable future, we expect that as bicycle volumes continue to increase, 
the model at least, would say that the crashes are going to continue to increase as well. And so we're not going to just say, well, that's just the way it is. <laughs> Our goal and what we've been talking about in the bike plan is that we need to buck that trend. And we need to be realistic about it, that it's a real challenge as the volumes increase. But the, you know, that's the challenge that we're looking at trying to, to face to try to figure out how can we do this better than what the model says is going to happen and how can we decrease crashes. So that's what we're going to be working on. How, um, looking at this graph, how does um, bus, bus mode factor into that? Because obviously if you have a full bus, then it replaces like, you know, whole bunch of cars. <laughs> yeah, and that's a, that's a great question. Really, the, the vehicle volume that they used in the model would include buses, and so it's not, it's, not, it's not people trips or people volume, it's vehicle volume. So it's, you know, it's probably not that refined that it's going to be, you know, one bus versus 35 vehicles kind of a thing. So. We've gotten that new um, bike traffic light. What's your opinion on that as with the little amount of time we've had it with it so far? Well, we're, Can we're, you give yeah. them a little background of yeah. where that is? So we're talking about the intersection of Mason and Laurel. Uh, everybody who's been there, you know, it's, it's part of the max BRT route. The, the intersection is pretty funky with, you know, north-south Mason being offset quite a bit there. Trying to figure out how to accommodate bikes at that intersection, particularly southbound bikes on Mason, has been a real challenge. And if anybody's been through there, you'll notice that we've put in like a green uh, channelizing path through the intersection to try to get people to, to, to get safely over the tracks and over to the Mason Trail on the east side of the street. As we also put in a, a separate bicycle signal there. That's our first bike signal in town. Uh, and the way it's ended up working is the bikes are sharing the, the, the lane with the buses. And the way that signal works, they get to go first before the other cars get to go. Um, it's been in for probably a week now, or just a little over a week, week and a half. Um, we've been working on our detection system to make sure we're detecting the bikes po properly. Um, and then Tessa's had um, people out, bike ambassadors out, trying to educate bicyclists about the right way to do it. So far, we feel good about it. Um, there's, there's been some kinks, and, and bicyclists are still trying to figure it out as well. But long term, we hope it'll really improve the, the safety and operation at that intersection. We'll move to our, move to our third panelist, Tessa. Uh, Tessa, one of the goals identified in the dra draft bicycle master plan is to improve safety for all modes of transportation. With an emphasis on bicycle safety, what does that look like, and how does your organization or your department play a role in achieving that goal? Sure. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll start with kind of the last, the last piece of the question first. Um, so FC Bikes is part of um, planning, development, and transportation. Um, we're part of FC Moves, which is transportation planning and safe routes to school. Um, and we really look at bicycle safety comprehensively. Um, we have an extensive bicycle education program. We're expanding that um, with our Bicycle Ambassador program. We partner with law enforcement on um, various enforcement and education initiatives. We do a lot of encouragement to try to get people out um, feeling more confident and more comfortable using the roads. Um, and then one of the really big um, focus areas that's, um, that's grown over the past couple years in our department um, in partnership with other city departments like traffic operations, engineering, um, and our streets department is focusing on planning, bicycle planning, infrastructure design, and then evaluation. And so we, like I said, we kind of take a comprehensive approach to looking at bicycle safety, um, but to speak specifically about the bicycle master plan, um, and I, I do want to mention that just as of about an hour ago, we have the draft, and this is just one piece of it, so um, yeah. Good night reading there. Um, we just posted the draft on our um, website, so we really encourage all of you to take a look at that um, and look at um, how you think it addresses bicycle safety in the community. Um, we have the public comment period open for about three weeks, so just wanted to mention that. Um, but the bicycle master plan really focuses a lot on infrastructure, and it does this for a couple reasons, one being that we um, the community is really already leading the way nationally in terms of our bicycle programming, our education efforts, encouragement, um, as I spoke about uh, a few seconds ago. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we're really focusing on kind of the next era of bicycle planning and design, and we really see that as holding significant potential in terms of increasing ridership and then really improving safety for, for all modes, but um, with, a, with a focus on, on bicycling 
So we're pretty, pretty excited about where this is headed. Um, we're testing out a lot of new ideas currently, um, and there are a lot of new ideas that you'll see in this bicycle, bicycle master plan that really look at an all ages and abilities approach. So really making um, our streets even more comfortable for people um, from 8 to 80 to, to get out there and feel um, safe and comfortable um, traveling around the community on bikes. Um, so I do want to say that safety has been a key focus throughout the development of the Bicycle Master Plan. Um, we looked at this in terms of analyzing our crash data. You'll see a lot of that in our existing conditions report. We looked at this in terms of a, what we called a level of comfort analysis or a uh, level of traffic stress analysis. So we actually looked at every street in the system and rated it one to five in terms of um, perception of comfort or safety for a typical or an average bicyclist um, today. So we were able to use that information and it's really based on a lot of the, um, the positive results we've seen from, um, from some of these um, infrastructure designs in Europe dating back to the 1970s. Um, that's really the basis for this level of traffic stress analysis or level of um, bicycle comfort analysis. Ultimately, that information informed where we're proposing future improvements, um, and so that's, that's really a key piece of that. And I won't go into all the details about the, the bike plan, but um, what you'll see is a big emphasis on what we're calling the low stress network, so the 2020 low stress network. And what this does is it really takes advantage of a lot of the locations that are already comfortable for, for bicyclists, already low speeds, um, already have a low um, rate of bicycle crashes, um, and looks at how we can connect those through protected intersection crossings, through wayfinding, um, through other enhancements to really create a system that um, is comfortable and safe for people of all ages and abilities. So um, we're really excited about this. It's, it's kind of a new, new approach um, for Fort Collins, but um, it's cost effective and it takes advantage of a lot of the system that we already have in place. Um, so I would, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at that if you have if you have a chance, um, there will be, like I said, a comment period, um, so, we, so we look forward to those comments. Um, but I would say, sorry, just two more seconds. Kind of, you know, what I see is the, I guess, the future vision in terms of safety. Um, I think that's kind of getting to Joe's point in terms of our safety metric, not only having, having a good metric in place and making sure that we're, um, we're achieving that through our various countermeasures and the types of programs and infrastructure designs that we're implementing. Um, but I think a safe community will um, be reflected in who we see riding out there. Um, so we'll see more women. We'll see uh, more people of all ages and abilities, more youth bicycling. And I think that's really going to be a reflection of um, how effective we've been at implementing this bicycle master plan and implementing some of the, the different initiatives that we're talking about to really improve safety. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> a good first round. Um, questions for Tessa? Tessa? Tessa, why can't we have some sort of identification on bicycles? They don't need to buy a license or anything, but have some sort of an identification sticker on them or something? Mm -hmm. um, so we do, we have a bicycle registration system in place. Um, we work with police services on getting the word out about that, um, and we have cards that we hand out at our different events to encourage people to register their bikes. CSU also has um, a mandatory bicycle registration program um, uh, for $10. You can register your bike for, for your lifetime. Um, so we do have those in place. Um, yeah, part of that is there's no legal requirement for them to do so. No, it's not legal. That's, that, that's the, whenever you're trying to, I guess you, you want to mandate that they have to have it, we have to have a law in place to do so. Um, if not, it's a voluntary compliance. It's similar to the helmet law or the helmet situation where if we want folks to wear helmets, either explain the education and the benefit of, so that they can see it for themselves or we have to mandate it through the government. Those are kind of your two options. They either go willingly or we drag them to it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, sorry. I, I think I misunderstood your, your question. Um, but you know, this is something mandatory registration has been done in in a few cities around uh, around North America, and I I'm not sure some of them some of those cities have revoked those those programs because they haven't been super effective. Um, but I think it is something that we could we could look at. In the uh, trauma stuff and everything with the bicycles and all, um, are they increase? Do they increase when the students are here? 
we do see an increase when the students are here. We see an increase with Tour de Fat or New West Fest or those other really big, big events, most definitely. Mm -hmm. Graduation, unfortunately. Tessa, could you speak a little bit more about the ambassador program? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so the, the Bicycle Ambassador Program was launched in 2012. Um, it was one of the initiatives that came out of the Bicycle Pedestrian Education Coalition. It's now coordinated um, by the city, by our, our department. Um, but basically we have, we have over 40, um, I believe 40 volunteer bicycle ambassadors that we train um, through some of our education programs to be out in the community um, as ambassadors. Um, so just offering um, information to people that are biking around town, um, also to be um, available to provide presentations on bicycle commuting, bicycle safety at businesses. Um, our bicycle ambassadors also help us teach our traffic skills 101 course, which is an eight hour course that we have every other month. Um, so it's really a program that um, is designed to expand our education and outreach efforts um, beyond the staff that we have at the city and, and really get the community engaged in um, increasing that awareness of, of safe cycling. So, does this, um, thank you. so do the ambassadors go as, as young as like high school? You know, what's the yeah, that's, that's another great question. I, did, I didn't plant her, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so we're actually launching, um, we're, we're still determining the, the most appropriate name, the, the cool name for the, the high school students. But um, yeah, we've been calling it the High School Bicycle Ambassador Program. Um, it will be sort of a, a part of the Bicycle Ambassador Program, and we already have several high school students that have signed up for that. Um, we just brought on a new um, FC Bikes Program Specialist who will be leading that program in partnership with Safe Routes to School. Um, so we're, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, I think it holds a lot of potential both in terms of providing education to high school students, but also having them serve as mentors um, as part of the Safe Routes to School program and being, being able to teach some of those Safe Routes um, classes to uh, middle school students and then elementary as well. Great, yep. thank you. Mm -hmm. Tessa, a safety technique I've heard of for school children is forming a bicycle train where a group of students and perhaps parents uh, meet and then travel uh, en masse mm -hmm. to, to school. Do you know if that's been tried here or is that, if that's part of the Safe Routes to School? Yes, so Safe Routes to Schools program does include bicycle trains. We've delivered uh, training or education programs to approximately 70% of the schools overall, primarily or starting with elementary school, but now middle school and high schools as well. And the, the bike the walking bus has been a really effective thing, and the bicycle train has been a really effective thing for kids. Basically, it provides an opportunity for kids to safely commute under supervision to their schools. Great. Officer Case, your turn. You're up. Um, your question, we hear from so many people in the community their frustration with scofflaw bicyclist behavior. Although I think if you plumb the issue deeply enough, you'll find scofflaw auto drivers, scofflaw pedestrians, scofflaw transit riders, you name it. On that. Um, uh, what is the perspective from police services regarding bicycle enforcement? Has it shown to be effective? Um, what, what are the priorities in terms of bicycles? Well, as, as Joe's pointed out, um, we do have, obviously, we've had an increase in bicycle crashes as our population has grown, our bicycling population has grown. Um, one of the problems that we run into in law enforcement is, and I know you guys have heard this a hundred times, so I'm trying not to sound too cliche, there's only so many of us. And we have to establish a priority for not only traffic safety, but also for general safety for 911 calls, et cetera. All of the myriad of activities that law enforcement has to take care of. Um, from a traffic safety standpoint, which is my area of expertise in the traffic enforcement unit, um, we look at what causes the conflicts between the bicyclists and the motorists, um, whether it's cars, trucks, SUVs, buses, whatever, um, and the bicyclists. And what we find um, through the statistical proportions is about half of our crashes are caused by the actions of the cyclist whether it's, um, as Josh pointed out, riding on the wrong side of the road or cutting out from uh, the sidewalk, jumping into traffic, um, things of that nature. And unfortunately, we are pretty much reactive to most of that type of enforcement because the collision has already happened. It's very hard for us to um, 
I mean, obviously we can't stop you before you commit the crime. We, we can't fortune tell, oh, I know you're gonna run the red light, so I'm gonna stop you now and give you a ticket for it. Um, but what we can do is try to offer an educational standpoint as we see these violations occurring. We use um, the statistical data from uh, traffic engineering. Joe has been great about providing us with that information so that we're able to identify um, our, our top collision intersections where we know we have a lot of violations there. We have a lot of bicyclists that get struck by motorists and we try to get out to enforce those areas. Um, are we gonna prevent every one of these? I, I, realistically, there's no way for us to. Um, one of the, the bad parts of this is like I said, we run into our, bi no pun intended, we run into our bicycle crashes. Um, the most of our, um, our riders, when they're the, the cause of the accident, um, they fall into two general categories, and one is ignorant, where they simply don't know the rules. They don't know how they're supposed to ride their bike on the road. And the other group is I refer to as the arrogant. They know the rules, but they're going to violate them anyway because they don't want to follow the rules for whatever reason. Um, and I know that's an overall generalization, and I'm sure everyone's going to, poke at me and go, no, but not this guy, but not that guy. Um, and like I said, these are the ones where the bicyclist is at fault. Um, we try to hold the car drivers accountable when they're in a collision, whether it's with another car or a stationary object, and we're starting to get more enforcement to do that with the bicyclist. Um, a lot of our officers simply didn't take the time to do it because it was a lower priority. We have pushed that priority up with the police department because of the fact that we're seeing more of them and it has become as you folks are testament to it's become a hotter topic in the community um, bicycle safety is you know, i mean it, it's on the rise as far as where it's going to fall um, you mentioned some of the items that got pulled up, up above the line on the bfo offers last night that's a direct reflection of it and we're going to try to adjust our priorities to do the same thing great any questions for Dar officer case Thanks, officer. Back on the vehicle scope law part of this, to my mind anyway, there's a lot of difference between a bicyclist on a five pound, 50 pound bicycle and a 4,000 pound car running amok. I'm not a bicyclist, but I have friends who've reported, you know, people hitting them with the mirrors. I mean, actually being aggressive towards a bicycle with this behemoth of steel. How do you get into that? I mean, that's almost attempted murder, and, and if you think about it. Well, attempted murder might be a bit of a stretch um, because you have to have intent to kill to go with attempted murder, and I don't think that's the intent of the driver, but I don't read minds. Um, part of that is we have to identify, I guess, the culture, and, and the community has to accept that bicycles are here, they're going to be on the roads, whether you're for bikes or against bikes or neutral on bikes, they exist. And that's a part of that educational process of us educating the bicyclists and educating the motorists about what makes it legal to do various things. One of the issues that we run into as far as that educational process is, and I'm just by a show of hands, how many of you took a driver's class before you got your driver's license and started driving a car? Okay. How many of you have taken one since? Three of you. Yeah. The, the idea is that we have a captive audience when you're about 14 to 16 years old. So we can pour as much traffic safety knowledge into you as we can in that brief span of window. Afterwards, it's what you catch on the news. It's the updates that you get via the internet or what you hear from your friends. It's not a formal educational setting anymore. So the laws get conflicting. The law information gets conflicted, gets diluted. And we don't have that structure to educate the general public about traffic safety that we have when you're younger. So as the laws change, one of the things you pointed out about hitting you with the mirror, the recent law in the last few years, the three foot rule. Well, I'll be quite honest with you, the three foot rule is unenforceable unless you actually get struck with the mirror. That's the only way I can write someone a ticket for it because I have no way to effectively judge three feet between your bike and that car while the car is going 35 and you're going 15. That will get thrown out of court every time we write the ticket. So it, it was good idea, but it's a wrong execution of, of the right idea. So I hope that answers some of your question, but it's, it's, like I said, it's that mindset that we have to change with the motorists to accept cyclists as vehicles. I, I understand that, but you, know, you talk about the only cases you get to ride up are the ones where there's actually been a wreck and the police were called. But I know you guys stake out stop signs from time to time when you mm -hmm. think there are people running them. And you sit there and write tickets all day long to people that 
have run that stop sign. Why isn't that kind of enforcement available where we know there's bicycle risks in play? We, we do that as well. Like I said, we identify those areas, like I said, where we see a lot of our collisions. As far as um, you're, you're mentioning, you know, vehicles passing too close to, to a bicyclist, it's very hard for us to do that because we don't have all the bicyclists in the same spot, except at intersections. Dr. Marty? I was just going to make a comment. Um, there was an officer at the BPEC meeting, the bicycle pedestrian meeting, a few months ago who was talking about this, and I forget his name. Tessa was probably there who did talk about the number of citations given to cyclists has really ramped up the past three to six months to address these issues. Um, I think they're targeting around Old Town and CSU campus. So, I mean, I can't remember the numbers, but I think it, you know, were several hundred over the previous quarter as opposed to zero a year ago. So I do think that the enforcement, which is part of the League of American Cyclists, I think that that is improving significantly. Right. I mean, do you agree with that? Do you definitely? And the, re the and you mentioned the old town and the, around the campus. That's where we get our highest concentration of collisions because that's also where we have our highest concentration of bicyclists. I was just wondering, uh, over the last few years, have you noticed any difference in the animosity level uh, or that cultural level that uh, allows for bicyclists versus uh, uh, the, the older one where? There was almost a, a wanting to drive people off the roads if you were a bicyclist. If I understand your question correctly, are, are we seeing the animosity between the vehicles and the, the bicyclists? We still see it. Um, I, I can't speak to any statistics as far as the numbers that we get. Um, I don't think it gets reported as often simply because the fact that usually, um, and I've, I've been in that situation where I've been the cyclist that's almost been hit with the mirror. Um, you don't think to get the license plate number of the car as it's going by because you're so panicked that you're about to hit the curb and, and eat dirt. Um, so I don't think it gets reported as, as probably as much as it happens, but that is truly anecdotal. I heard the term, um, and I think it's called rolling coal, and that is when a diesel vehicle is passing you and they decide to... I don't know how they do that. Maybe you can explain how that rolling coal comes. But, and I don't know whether this falls into the safety issue or not, but when we talk about being hit by a mirror, getting hit by rolling coal, which I have had been hit with that, is disgusting. Right. The way that's accomplished, and that's uh, actually been another topic that we've also uh, working to increase our enforcement on, um, the way that the truck drivers do that is it's a diesel truck that basically it feeds the exhaust back in through the ignition back through the combustion chamber um, as part of the turbocharging of the diesel. What they've done is they've changed the exhaust system, they've changed the computer chips where it dumps raw fuel into the exhaust and all of the black smoke that you see coming out is unburnt, is not com it's partially combusted diesel fuel, which is why when they stomp on the accelerator, it dumps the fuel into the, it, into the exhaust system and that big black cloud of smoke rolls out. Um, it's annoying not only for cyclists, for pedestrians, for folks that are trying to eat outdoor cafes, for police officers that have our windows rolled down, um, which a young man yesterday found out the hard way. Um, and what we, we have found, honestly, there are, there are some gaps in the state emissions law as far as how we can enforce that, that particular aspect going the emissions route. What we've utilized here in Fort Collins is kind of a roundabout way to enforce that. And instead of enforcing it as an emissions violation, we refer to it as an exhibition of acceleration or a demonstration of horsepower for the vehicle. Now, the, the good and the bad part. Um, the, the bad part is the fact that we're not actually going after the true emissions violation, which is what that is. But the good part is it has a much higher fine and the emissions violation is a zero point violation because it's not considered a moving violation. The exhibition of acceleration is five points against their license. Um, it gets their attention very quickly when they get a $250 ticket with five points attached to their license. Um, we're, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, we're finding that as a, uh, I don't want to say a unique enforcement tool, but it's one that we, file, we found fits and the city prosecutor and the city, uh, the city judge are accepting on charges. Do you need more than just the license plate? Do you need to have eye-to-eye -eye contact with the driver we, so you can have, identify him? Yeah, we have to have a way to identify the driver, or if we see it, we'll, we'll stop the vehicle and, and we'll, we'll identify the driver for you. Um, I've started to ride with a, a video camera mm -hmm. um, just for my own protection, and 
you know, if, if I encounter an aggressive driver, can I provide that video to the police department? Would that do me any good? You can't. Um, one of the, the downsides, as he mentioned, we have to be able to identify the actual driver. Mm -hmm. So if you have video of the vehicle, we may be able to contact the owner of the vehicle, but we may not be able to take actually enforcement. We could definitely contact them and, and advise them of, hey, you know, either you or someone who was driving your vehicle at this date and time you know, was driving improperly and, and to correct that behavior. Okay. And that being said, I don't want to give the wrong perception. I found that drivers here are pretty courteous, in my opinion, to cyclists. I found them to be, during my six years here, to be ruder as a driver, but um, got a progressively more aggressive behavior when I'm in a car. But as a bicyclist, I've, I've been very pleased here. I'm also interested in these unburnt diesel particulate matter mm -hmm. sprayings that are happening in the public. I'm very disappointed to hear that we don't have the ability to take that vehicle off the road. And my understanding is that one of the loopholes is that the officers are not getting eight hours of training to be able to give an opacity judgment as to how thick that cloud of smoke is. And my understanding is it's only an eight hour class to be able to visually say that vehicle's been modified and should be off the road. Are, is, do you know of anything in the police department that is taking steps forward to be able to get this training to be able to be more forceful to take some of these vehicles off the road that are offending pedestrians and cyclists and everybody? I mean, we have, we have looked into the training. The training that you speak of is actually, um, it's put on by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment out of Denver. Um, we have to bring the trainers um, to Fort Collins to have them you know, instruct the class for our officers here. It, it is an all-day class, and unfortunately, with our training schedule already tied up, it falls as a lower priority. Like I said, we have found another tool to enforce this with the exhibition of acceleration law instead of the opacity readings. One of the uh, conversations I see pop up every once in a while is the Idaho stop, going to a stop sign and not coming to a complete stop, putting two feet on the ground and going. I've never had a problem with that here, but is, uh, is there a law for two feet on the ground here? And sh do you think that's one of those things that we have a possibility of changing that law so that it makes it easier for you to prioritize what you pull over? Well, as far as I know, there's no law that requires anyone to put a foot on the ground, including a motorcyclist. The law for a stop sign is that you have to come to a complete stop. Um, once the vehicle comes to a stop, the motorist or the bicyclist can continue on. Um, I know as one of the motorcycle officers here, I can stop my Harley without having to put a foot down and continue on. Um, takes a little bit of balance, and you guys have seen people at red lights that can balance for three, four, or five minutes, which I'm amazed at, quite honestly. Um, but there's people that can do it without putting a foot down. One of the other things you mentioned, and I don't know the, the Idaho law that you're referring to, I'm assuming that's the two foot down rule. Um, I've actually heard um, a push a few months ago to go the other direction, where they want to end the stop as yield law, um, where basically you can pull up into a stop sign, and if it's clear to go, you continue on without having to stop. When I first heard of that idea, I scratched my head for a moment and I went, um, no. And the reason I say that is because, and, and I don't have the power to bless it from the department, but my personal opinion on that is it's a bad idea because it's not the car you see that's going to hit you. It's the car that you don't see that usually hits a bicyclist. Um, and if you ride up to an intersection with a stop sign, the reason that stop sign is there is to stop the traffic that direction to provide safe passage for everyone at that intersection, including the bicyclist. Um, and, and Joe and I were speaking about it before uh, the meeting started, and, and I kind of gave him the, the explanation of even if you have the right of way, if you're on a bicycle and pull in front of an automobile, you may be right, but it may cost you. Uh, because it's, th there's very few things that a bicycle runs into or gets hit by that the bicycle wins. Um, so it's, you know, and which is unfortunate, but I mean, even though you're right, you may be the one that ends up paying the penalty. Tessie, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, add on to that quickly. Um, so last year, the bicycle advisor, and there are several people in this room that could probably um, provide some context to this as well, but uh, the Bicycle Advisory Committee um, looked pretty extensively, extensively at the stop as yield or Idaho stop law 
Um, they did quite a bit of research looking at different communities. Um, right now, there are only, it's the state of Idaho and then a, a few smaller towns in Colorado that have actually adopted some, some type of stop as yield um, law. And so there isn't a lot of data or evidence that shows um, the, the benefits associated or the, the impacts associated with, with moving toward a law like that. Um, but uh, also encountered a number of issues that um, uh, helped the Bicycle Advisory Committee come to the recommendation that it wasn't, didn't make sense um, for the time being. It may be something, you know, if it came down statewide um, that, that would be considered here in the future, but, um, and feel free to add to this, Sylvia. Um, but yeah, there are jurisdictional issues. There are just a number of issues um, associated with that. Um, and so that's kind of where the, the Bicycle Advisory Committee landed um, last year on that topic. Sylvia and Bruce, I'm going to let you tag team this. I'll let you both have a shot at this last question that we have. Um, you're here both representing, you're wearing a bunch of different hats. We've got the Bicycle Advisory Committee, which is an advisory committee that reports to the Transportation Board and, pro and provides input. Um, Bike Fort Collins and the CSU Bicycle Advisory Committee. Um, what do you see as the role of education in increasing safety? Are there things we should be doing that we're not? So let me start by talking about Bike Fort Collins for those of you that may not be familiar with it. So our whole mission in life is to advocate for safe and enjoyable cycling. In the role of safety, a couple of the things that we do that are really highlights, we deliver education for the Safe Routes to Schools program. So it's directed by Nancy Nichols. It's part of the city of Fort Collins and transportation. We do all the, the education. We run things like the moving school buses that we talked about before, uh, the walking school buses, things like that. We uh, also manage the bike library on a contract for the city of Fort Collins as well. We get out and involved in pretty much every event that has anything to do with bicycling in the city during the year. So this year, something like 25 events we were involved with. And the reason for that is all about safety. So we have this little game that we play at our booth called Legal or Not, where we have, I think it's about eight different photographs of movements between motor vehicles and bicycles. And people come by and tell us whether they think they're legal or not. It's a great way to engage the public and, and really hopefully increase their knowledge of not just bicycle safety, but the law in general, as it applies to that. For the Open Streets event, for those of you that attended that this year, we helped to run the uh, protected bike lane demo that was part of that. So it's an infrastructure approach to safety that actually protects bicyclists. That's another thing we're involved with. Um, in the advocacy area, which is near and dear to my heart, there are a couple things going on. So we have something called RAT Rides, it's R-A-T as in Ride Around Town, and there are several people in the audience who participate in these rides who are part of the CFI group. Uh, we will identify a route each month, this is a monthly ride, we'll ride the route, take notes, have discussions during the ride, we stop, and then at the end we'll stop and have a beer and kind of wrap up and summarize everything. I condense those into a report that goes to TESA, and it's been a great collaboration. So to use an example, the first ride that we went on this year was in, I believe it was May. We rode south on the Mason Trail from, I think, starting here on Maple, clear down to Prospect. Some of the things we found was no painting at all on the multi-use trail that ran through CSU property a lack of signage at all of the cross streets where the trail crossed the street, so lack of yield signs, lack of stop signs, things like that. The need for another crossing across Prospect, because it was very, well, it still is a somewhat confusing crossing, but it, it's better now. And one of the things I wanted to say is all of those changes have actually been made. So there are, there is paint on the middle of the trail now uh, through a lot of help from Joel. Uh, he's, he's gotten involved in providing yield signs, stop signs along the trail, which has really helped to improve the safety there. So um, we get involved in doing this on a, on a monthly basis, pick a different route, and wind up creating a different report. And it's been a great collaboration, like I said, to help improve the safety and also make some contributions towards improving the infrastructure here in the city. The other thing that we're doing, and, and I'll stop and let Sylvia get a chance to talk here, is I just call it broadening out in the advocacy area. So one of the things that 
is just starting is myself working with Jeff Nozzle from CFI to collaborate on an event that we're going to head. Can you explain what CFI is? I'm sorry, yeah. So Coalition for Infrastructure. So there's a bunch of folks in the audience who are part of the Coalition for Infrastructure, which is another advocacy group in the city that advocates for, I'll just say all things cycling, but definitely a heavy focus on bicycling safety and how that uh, is impacted by the law and a lot of related, uh, related topics to that. Um, we are in the very early stages of planning an event for January. I had one conversation with Tessa about it so far, but the focus is how do we use the bicycle community as advocates to move along to the next level of success for Fort Collins. In this case, it would be the diamond level, moving from platinum to diamond. So stay tuned. I'm not going to talk any more about it tonight because it's, as I said, still in the very early stages of planning. But um, it's got great possibilities and will include, if it materializes like we think, people from all over the community. So I'm going to stop and let you say a few words now. Well, thanks, Bruce. Um, so kind of segueing on what Bruce was talking about, Bike Fort Collins, I guess one thing I should qualify is that we are the two on this whole panel that are just here as volunteers and as advocates. We are not paid to do any of this. So our jobs with Bike Fort Collins, our jobs with the Campus Bike Advisory Committee um, and BAC, the uh, Bike Advisory Committee, are all just on our own time and due to our passion for cycling. But um, with that said, um, Bike Fort Collins has several different groups and subcommittees that we've recently formed. And as Bruce was saying, he's involved primarily with advocacy um, and then the overall board structure. I am um, on the Marketing and Communications Committee, and we're responsible for the messaging that Bike Fort Collins puts out. And we're just, we have several of our community members here in the audience as well. And we're just in the process right now of really redefining what is the messaging that Bike Fort Collins is putting out. We're really, really trying to um, emphasize that it's a mutual um, bike and automobile message. Um, we're not just pointing fingers at automobiles saying, you're scofflaws, you're doing the wrong thing, and we don't want people doing the same thing to bicycles. We really want each other to have some kind of mutual respect for each other, and then also watch out for each other at the same time. So you're gonna see some new targeted messaging along those lines, um, educating and targeting motorists, and educating and targeting bicyclists as well. And we're always willing to take in uh, feedback and other committee members if anybody's interested in joining us. So, um, so that's marketing communications. One of the big um, programs that we've done in the past that's Fort Collins, uh, Bike Fort Collins has been working on, has been putting out to the public and is now about to revamp is the You Know Me, I Ride a Bike campaign. And it's really putting a face on typically nameless bike riders. So we're now in the process of finding new faces and new cyclists to feature in our ads. And we're going to feature anywhere between five to 10 cyclists do a little um, bio on each of the cyclists and let people know that I'm Karen Wykenot, the mayor of Fort Collins, and I ride a bike, and you know me. And I also drive a car, but I also ride a bike. So, you know, we want to have people um, portrayed in a positive light as cyclists and people that are fairly well known in the community, doesn't have to be a celebrity, but just, you know, names and faces that people may know at this point. Um, so that's in the works right now. Um, the legal or not as, um, Bruce was mentioning the Legal or Not campaign as we have it. It's a series of photos that um, have a little quiz attached to it and all the booths and booths and booths that we attend through primarily through March through October. Um, anywhere that will take us, we'll set up a booth for Bike for Collins and um, push our educational messages and bike safety messages. Um, Legal or Not has been super successful and so much to the point that we're about to go on to a level two of the program now and come up with a whole new scenario of do you think that this picture is legal or not? Because um, most of the people that um, in this community have probably already gone through the first round of it and have done quite well. Um, so then we have a lot of youth-related programs as well and student CSU-related. So my other hat, I, I work at CSU. I do communications and marketing for housing and dining services. That's my paid job. Um, we have um, the Campus Bike Advisory Committee as well, which is similar to the City's Bike Advisory Committee. It's a group that meets monthly, and it's uh, made up of um, faculty, staff members from all across campus and some students as well. 
and we meet to discuss issues that are on campus. We don't really have a budget yet, but we're working on that. We have a name, <laughs> and we have a, a solid, dedicated group of people that are meeting. Um, you know, we're giving input on issues such as, um, you know, the around the horn and the MAC system, and tying into that bike share on campus, zip car and multimodal pieces, not just the bike pieces. Um, and then also how to educate students. Um, one of the things that we're really gonna be targeting this next year is um, really educating first year students primarily because then you figure if you get them in that first year, you've got them for the next three or four years and hopefully even as graduate students, so then they're educated at that point. And we're doing that primarily through um, outreach through the residence halls because 5,700 students this year are living on campus. Next year we'll be adding another residence hall online so we'll be going up by 300, 400 more students. So we have an opportunity there and then also through RAM orientation which takes place during the summer which is mandatory for every first year student to attend. And we're gonna be doing um, some real outreach letting students and families and parents know that it's not necessary to have a car on campus. So. We already have a lot of bikes on campus now, um, and longboards and skaters. We'll probably have a lot more in the future, especially if we can convince these students not to bring their cars to campus. Currently, there is, there is a, a fee to park on campus, which is pretty high. That's gonna be going up in the near future. And then um, there is no regulation uh, currently that doesn't allow students to bring cars to campus. So some schools, some universities do have regulations that um, don't allow at least first year, sometimes second year students not to bring cars to campus. So that's another big thing we're working on. And we're also trying to really blend the master plan. So the city master plan along with the CSU bicycle master plan, um, which is currently being worked on by the same consulting group as the city's working with, tool design group. So we're trying to really um, mesh those plans together so that we can move forward together and not be at odds with each other and not have the students and uh, the CSU community, you know, kind of always be the bad guys um, and girls. Um, so youth related, I've talked a bunch about that. Um, you know, we did work with more than 6,000 students this year at Poudre School District Schools, as well as pre-K programs through the Safe Routes to School program through Bike Fort Collins and the partnership with the city. Um, it's been wildly successful. I just, um, last three weeks I volunteered at Blevins Junior High working with sixth graders. And I know there's different grades that are being worked with at different schools and at different programs. And Bike Fort Collins and the city are not the only ones doing this. We also have league certified instructors that are going out through other groups such as the Bike Co-op that are also doing education and outreach and safe cycling skills with students. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit in that area. We're educating a lot of the youth on how to ride right literally to the right of the road, how to take the lane, how to use hand signals, what helmet safety is all about, how to make eye contact with drivers, what's safe, what's unsafe behavior. Um, I'll tell you, working with junior high kids is very telling and it's very, it can be very challenging. The groups I've had were incredible. These kids, I mean, the minute you had them out there, you maybe you redirected them one time and then boom, they were really attentive and very engaged. You should see all the phenomenal thank you letters that, um, especially, excuse me, especially Doc Dickerson's been getting with Bike Fort Collins. Um, I've monopolized enough. So, um, if you have any questions though, specifically about what the Bicycle Advisory Committee has been doing, um, you know, our involvement with Bike Fort Collins or about CSU and how it relates, I know CSU has a bike education coordinator through the police department and she's really adamant about getting more enforcement because she feels like that's a really good education tool. Um, and not just because she works for police, but just because it's, it maybe college students need to be redirected a little more <laughs> right off the bat. Okay, let's go to some questions. The question I have could pertain to just anybody on the board here. I, uh, three years I worked at an Irish elementary and tried to get bicycles for some of the children out there, particularly first graders. I had a terrible time. Every agency I went to, well, they've got to come in and sign this and do this, and it would have been very frustrating to them, especially if they didn't speak very good English, uh, to get a bicycle for the child. And many times these bicycles for these children make the difference whether they fit into the neighborhood or they don't. And I, why can't you all, between you, uh, just have a very simple board that these people could go to and get a bicycle for a child? 
So one of the things that we have been doing for the Safe Routes program is we've acquired a fleet of bikes. And in order to make it available broadly, we have to share it. We can't let the kids keep the bikes, unfortunately, but we'll bring them to the schools. And so they can use the, they can actually use the bikes. So uh, Irish is a great example. Lincoln is another great example where there's a lot of kids that want to ride that just don't have bikes and they can't afford bikes. Mm -hmm. the other thing so the, oh, there's the bike co-op. Yeah. Um, which maybe Tessa was going to talk about, where um, people can go in and help work on bikes and earn their own bikes. Um, they can also purchase bikes. Um, there's the Santa Cops program, which maybe you could talk about, that um, right at, around the holidays, they um, start collecting bike donations and then give them out to um, people who have a, some kind of a perceived need. And then I know that you were mentioning Lincoln uh, junior high, they just purchased 20 bikes as their own fleet, and they have a bike club after school that students can join and use those bikes that the school already has on campus and then go out once a week. They have an uh, instructor, I believe it's a PE teacher, that takes them out. I, um, I have one more idea uh, that I've been thinking about over the years, and um, there are other colleges around the country that adopt a system for scramble modes. And, and what I mean by that is one of the highest incidents of accidents is at our intersections. And when we have 30,000 plus students coming in and getting on their bikes and riding, um, we really find that the intersections around the school are a challenge. And so what I think would really work well is if we either had no right on red for the motor vehicles or if we actually enabled the pedestrians to press a button to stop it for a moment where people could cross diagonally, they could get across the intersection safely. And my challenge is when I'm riding my bike or driving my car around CSU and we get to these intersections in the morning where it's flooded with people riding their bikes across, I have a really hard time watching these bright young students playing Frogger out there with transportation. And, and I just really want to know, can we stop the traffic? Can we, can we get the traffic to actually stop, like with no red on right, and, and actually give them an opportunity to get across with enough time to not feel pressured? because I see a lot of people who are trying to come across the intersection and cars that are turning right and you have to go through that moving traffic anyways and it seems to be very, very, very risky. And, and, I, and, I, and I'd like to know if the city of Fort Collins has interest in actually stopping the traffic and allowing the pedestrians to flow in these high traffic areas. I can take a crack at that. We're, we're trying, to, trying to take a data-driven approach to that and trying to look for locations where it makes sense to do that. Um, there are a couple of possibilities. Um, we actually have prohibited right turns on red at Shields and Plum where we have the bike box. Um, it's, it's sporadic uh, how effective that is. I was watching it today on one of our cameras and was seeing plenty of people disobeying that regulation. Um, and so it's difficult to do that, frankly. Um, well, like I said, we are looking for places to possibly do that. One we're, we're, we're thinking about is Shields and Elizabeth. Um, we have to look at the whole big picture, though, and when we start talking about crashes, it's not just bike crashes, it's, it's all crashes. And we have plenty of people getting hurt in vehicle vehicle crashes as well. And so we have to be conscientious of that. And, and you know, what we're looking to do is find a place where we can reduce the overall number of crashes and, and injury crashes. Um, and if we're going to increase them, we, we probably don't want to do it. And so it's definitely it's definitely something we've we've looked at. Like I said, Shields and Elizabeth is a place we might we, we've been talking about trying to do it, um, but we've not, we're not there yet as far as the evaluation and the analysis goes. Another infrastructure question. I happen to live at the north end of Mason, where it hits Cherry, and frequently drive up Mason from Laurel. The road's painted with sharrows, and it's narrow through there. And I've observed just a whole bunch of bicyclists really struggling trying to figure out what can I or should I do? When should I get out of the way? When should I keep the lane? And uh, I don't know if some signage would help or something, but it, it just looks awkward many, many times. And then there's bicyclists who just whiz through it and don't, don't pay any attention. Any thoughts on what could be done to improve that? 
Yeah, we've seen the same thing. And a shero is a shared lane marking is the official term for that. It's basically a marking showing the the proper location of a bicycle for a bicyclist on a street that's not wide enough to have a dedicated bike lane. And on several of the blocks on Mason, that's the situation where we don't have the width to have a bike lane, and so we put in shared lane markings to try to again, help bicyclists understand proper positioning and also to give warning to motorists that bicyclists could be taking the lane. And so that's the idea with the shared lane markings. Um, to make a long story short, we're gonna be looking at Mason again here coming up. Uh, Tess and I have been talking about it already. Um, in fact, we just had a meeting last week when we were talking about Mason and Laurel. That's kind of our net. We wanted to get Mason and Laurel done there because that was the critical, the most critical piece. But now we need to go and revisit that. And we need to work with transport on that as well because it affects how the MAX operates. And so it gets kind of complicated, but yeah, we feel like it can be better and we're working on that. Another infrastructure question. Um, on Timberline, uh, going north between Harmony and Prospect, the bike lane kind of meanders back and forth because there's multiple right turn lanes. So uh, for a section, it'll be along the, the curb and then it jumps out around the turn lane, so you're constantly zigzagging back and forth. And um, riding that kind of baffles me. It seems um, uh, confusing and, and uh, like it could be a problem because uh, you're kind of jumping in and out of, of, of traffic. Um, is, is that the best practice? Are there other ways to do that? Um, where we have situations where we have a through lane that becomes a right turn only lane, and I don't think that's the case on Timberline, but where we do have that, like on Harmony coming up to Boardwalk westbound, those are one of the most difficult uh, locations to stripe. And we do have a situation where the bike lane is up against the curb and then it just pops out in between the, the lane. And, and um, yeah, we're working on some other ways to do that as well. Um, where we have dedicated right turn lanes, and the turn lane moves over, the bike lane should just basically go straight, you know, and it dots across the, the transition area there. So those are kind of the two s situations that I'm, I'm thinking of. The, uh, the bike lane will be adjacent to the curb. Oh, oh. But then, yes. then there's a turn lane. Yes, that, okay. That <laughs> yes, I know what you're talking about. Now, north of, north of Drake there, we've got some strange lane w or street widths there where for whatever reason, as, as Timberline was built, um, it's built to different widths, and we've just got extra space there. Um, and that's one that, yeah, that should be on the list too to take a look at, see if we can figure out a way to make it more clear. It's a okay. good point. Talking about infrastructure, I'm wondering about Laporte and why there's no bike lane or why there's no sharrows and why there's no marking where the parking ends and the door zone is and where the bikes should be especially since you've got um, Putnam kids, Lincoln kids, and Pooter kids all traveling that. So kind of to broaden the question, how do you decide where to put sharrows versus bike lanes versus nothing at all? Yeah, so Laporte is another one where the, the width varies. And basically when they did resurfacing this last summer, um, we put in bike lanes anywhere we could. In fact, we even shrunk up the lanes and some the travel lanes in some locations to try to squeeze them in. Uh, there were some places there just was not room to do it uh, with with the on-street parking that's there. And so there are some segments where we don't have bike lanes. Uh, I'm not sure why they didn't put sharrows in there. That's something we can go back and look at. Is it possible to just remove the street parking so that there's room for the bikes? Yeah, it's possible, but the people who that affects tend to, to be opposed to that. And so... What we've talked about doing is going back in the future. It, it, the, reason, the reason we didn't when we did it is because the street maintenance program was going in there to pave, and we didn't have a lot of time to do a public outreach process. And so within the, within the scope of the time that we had to actually go do it, we did what we could with the idea that we would go back and approach those folks in the future to try to say, you know, do you really need this parking? Because a lot of it's not, you know, highly utilized. Um, and so there could be a chance that that actually could come off. We just didn't feel comfortable just going out one day and people coming out of their house and finding their parking gone because that doesn't typically go well for us when we do that. So there's a chance that it could happen in the future though. Open question to anybody in the audience or to the board. Are there any issues or topics that we haven't touched on yet? I think we're on an infrastructure theme right now. 
sorry, I'm staying on infrastructure. But ever since the the bike box and the green the greenness of Plum Street came about, I really loved that. But I see it totally misused. And I read that the federal government says the green paint has no good or bad effect, so they're not going to fund any projects that do that. But then we put in Harmony, we striped that green. So what's your thinking on the green paint? Are you like all for it or? You know, we're, we're, we're doing some of the green paint as a pilot project. So you're right, the federal government isn't necessarily funding it, but they have authorized the use of it. So what most communities are doing is, is they're ending up using it to kind of use at conflict points, kind of like at Harmony and Boardwalk where I was talking about where it's confusing. There might be a benefit for it there. We're not seeing a lot of communities do miles and miles of green bike lanes. Um, we tried that on Harmony, again, just as an experiment to see how it worked um, and to kind of evaluate the cost of doing that. And, and I can tell you that you know, we're kind of moving more towards the idea of using like buffered bike lanes or even protected bike lanes versus green bike lanes um, just because of the cost related to it. I'd like to jump back to education. And I know there's lots going on in the schools and there's stuff starting up on campus, but I, when I had to run out and come back, I was driving and turned left almost right into a bicyclist with no lights going the wrong way on the street. And there's got to be some way to teach these folks how dangerous that is. And so I'm wondering if there's been any brainstorming about other ways to get that message out, that you have to have lights, you shouldn't be going the wrong way on the street, that kind of thing, other than classes. You know, I think people who are already interested might end up in a class, but people who aren't interested, how are we reaching them? I just want to add on to your question because I agree with you, and then I'll let our educators help answer because a high population of our injured cyclists are, are not going to be at the CSU classes or are not going to take the traffic 101. You know, they're, they're, they're our homeless uh, population. I mean, I just mentioned we had, you know, four serious accidents, auto bikes, and, you know, two of them were homeless individuals not wearing any light, n no reflective clothing, going the wrong way, and, you know, it's very difficult. So I do agree. I had thought of that earlier, so I'm glad you brought that up. I, w I would just add that um, so we've been, yeah, we've been trying to figure out what the, what the best strategy is for getting specific to your question about lights, um, getting lights out to the community um, and making sure that that educational message goes along with that. We are providing free lights um, through various Light Up the Night events, and we're trying to, this year, really focus those events so they're getting to the right people. Um, so we have light up the night events that will be happening um, over the next four months starting in November um, in different sectors of the community. We also provide free lights to community organizations like Homeless Gear to try to, again, get those lights out to the right people. And um, part of it is is going along with the, the education message. Um, and also police, uh, police services uh, provides lights um, as kind of a an enforcement um, incentive-based program that, th that they do. Um, and then, Bruce, did you want to talk about your? So I was going to mention one thing. We begun discussions of looking at alternative ways of delivering educational safety messages. One thing we're looking at is short video clips, like two, three minutes, that would be on YouTube, that, and they just basically, ideally, maybe go viral, and people would learn about them and start watching them and things like that. But we've begun some conversations with people that actually make professional videos to potentially start doing some of that. So I know Bike for Collins also has um, had conversations about reaching out to the typically underrepresented population. So it could be minorities, it could be homeless people, it could be the elderly. Um, you know, we can never do enough outreach and you can never educate enough. You, you know, once you get one group done, then a whole new group comes in that isn't aware of the message. So it's got to be this ongoing, sometimes cyclical sort of education. Um, so I know that there has been outreach done to some of the homeless populations in the past through Bike Fort Collins. I believe it was through Northern Catholic Charities, but I'm not certain of that. Um, but it, it's not something that has been continued over the years. Um, so that's one thing. And then we're also talking about, um, from the marketing communications perspective, doing um, some kind of ad series that um, focuses on different tips 
And, you know, whether it's, um, you know, real simple, real short, real small things that run frequently in the paper, um, on billboards, um, as trailers at the movie theaters that really um, focus on the safety aspect. So, you know, safe cycling, helmet safety, rules of the road in particular, because I can't tell you how many times, you know, there's just always this um, discussion between motorists and cyclists what the rules really are. And nobody really knows. So I'd like to see it come from maybe the police or some form of authority and have a series run in the paper, you know, full page ads that say, you know, this is these are the rules of the road. And we're speaking, um, you know, from a, a point of repute and a point of um, authority. You mentioned the education kind of as a or enforcement as an education tool. Um, the situation you described where there's a bicyclist at night, you know, he's riding on the wrong side of the road, no lights, no reflective material. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you a percentage, but I can say most of our police officers, if they were to see that, are gonna stop and contact the cyclist. Um, we may or may not issue a citation, but we're gonna explain to them, hey, these are the things, quite honestly, and not to be too blunt about it, these are the things that get bicycles killed, um, which is our number one priority is to stop that bicycle fatality. Um, and then let's work on reducing injuries and property damage, but the number one is let's save lives. And if that's a situation where that's going to be warranted, it may be a citation, or it may be, um, as Tess pointed out, we, many of our patrol officers, especially the ones that work at night, carry the small giveaway snap-on lights that we give to bicyclists. We contact them, say, hey, you need a, a light for your bicycle, you know, here's a light, use it, it'll help people see you so that you don't get hit. Um, and then, you know, kind of do that one person at a time education theory. Um, you know, they're educating several thousand at a time. We do it one at a time, either at the side of the road or the side of the car or, um, or wherever it happens to be. But that's kind of that um, personal service, I guess, that we deliver from the police department. Um, but we, we try to take every opportunity we can um, to do that. This one, I'm not sure this is for, whether this is best for Dr. Marty or Officer Case. Back on alcohol as a contributing factor to the wrecks. Obviously, we know in motor vehicle wrecks, a goodly number of the fatals are had alcohol isn't involved. And I, your data certainly suggests that's the case with the bicycle wrecks as well. But then there's also a phenomena that says, well, gee, if I'm going to go drinking, I better not take my car keys, I'll take my bike. So, A, how do you... How do we address the role of alcohol in wrecks to begin with? And then B, how do we keep it from becoming the alternative to drinking and driving? That's a really hard question. Um, exactly. I've worked with, um, there's two professors at CSU. Um, I can't recall their names right now, but they're teaching in the School of Public Health at a master's level right now. And they're looking at that because amongst the CSU students, both undergraduate and graduates, that's a very common theme. I'm not going to drink and drive because that's been really well enforced and well educated. Um, and talking with them, the students say there's really no other good alternatives. Max only goes north and south. There's limited taxis. They can only walk so far, et cetera. So um, I think we're looking into that. I don't know the answer. Uh, but I can tell you that um, many, many cyclists, when they are sober, uh, several hours or a day or something later, that will be one of the first things that they'll tell us. Or when their parents come, you know, at least my mom and dad aren't angry that I was drinking and driving. Uh, but I can tell you that they do have serious brain injuries, lost teeth, facial fractures, eye injuries, uh, with pretty significant financial as well as other cost. So, um, like I said, we're just looking at what we have and I'm working with all the people here and I'm not sure of the exact answer. Um, so that's a good question. The officer might have a different one. I do know I have had a couple cyclists that have been injured that have been given citations for intoxicated cycling. Uh, a few, not all of them. Uh, but that does, I think, help drive the point home uh, in addition to their injuries. Right. Um, a, a lot of people ref, um, kind of look at it as a lesser of two evils that, well, it's OK if I ride my bike home if I'm drunk because I'm not going to run over and kill a family of four, which is you know kind of the worst case scenario if you're driving drunk and go through a red light. Um, and from uh, and, and 
Dr. Marty sees it at the emergency room where you kind of see the results of the collisions where they're intoxicated run, and a lot of them hit fixed objects because the car that pulled out in front of them has actually been parked there for three hours. Um, <laughs> um, we, and, 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 and if you're the owner of the car, there's nothing, nothing um, worse to come back to your car after a dinner out in Old Town than to find an intoxicated person inside your car that went through the back window um, who's also unconscious. Um, but not, and I'm not making light of the situation. Please don't, please don't take that from this. Um, but a lot of them look at it as, well, I could be doing something so much worse. And I actually had a young man who told me one time, he goes, well, the only person I can hurt doing this is me. And I kind of looked at it and went, okay, you're right, except for the fact that you're going to tie up an awful lot of resources when that collision occurs because we have to do a police investigation. You have EMS, fire, the road is shut down, which is going to inconvenience. And I hate to use the word inconvenience because someone's life could possibly be in danger, but it's an inconvenience when my crash team shows up and we shut down Trilby and Shields for five hours to investigate a fatal accident. That's an inconvenience for commerce. It's an inconvenience for commuters, for anybody who has to go anywhere near that intersection. Um, not to mention all of the surrounding areas that the traffic gets now diverted into. Um, so we look at bicycle um, DUIs. It's actually a DUI because a bicycle is considered a vehicle, which is usually that's a little bit of an eye-opening experience when I explain to someone that I've contacted who's impaired on a bicycle, and I'm like, you realize this is a DUI arrest? And they think it's just going to be a ticket and that they're going to walk home and they end up in jail. And they, that's when the little light bulb clicks on and the eyes get really big when they realize, wait a minute, I'm getting a DUI? And we're like, yeah, it's the same crime. It's just the penalties aren't as severe because, once again, you're not going to, your, your likelihood of, of causing serious injury to someone else riding a bicycle is pretty slim. Um, and we mentioned earlier about the priorities of the police department. Um, and when we have our night shift officers that are looking for a DUI, they're generally looking for someone driving the four to five to 6,000 pound vehicle, um, or basically it's a 5,000 pound bullet going down the road with a drunk driver as opposed to the 15 pound Schwinn. Um, so, I mean, it's, we have that, that idea that, yeah, it's okay to ride drunk. We have people that, you know, that, that, you know, that walk down the street intoxicated. Um, part of that is the, you know, alcohol is a part of our culture. And it's, it's not, unfortunately not going to go away. We are trying to work to manage it, I guess. We've talked a lot about safety and a lot about infrastructure, but not really about the cost associated between the two. Because when you, we invest in infrastructure, there's a cost for that. And we're trading off uh, not investing in infrastructure by giving up safety. And so I was wondering if you guys had a feel or a dollar value you could put, like say, what is a life worth in terms of infrastructure? If we kill two people a year, would it have been worth $100,000, a million dollars, or something like that for infrastructure improvements to have prevented that? Um, because these are really tied, and what is the dollar value associated with the crashes and the uh, loss of life between those two? I can take a shot at that. That's a really good question. I, I, th I think there's another part of that, too, and that's the limited budget that we have to spend. And it, it may be less about, you know, you know what's, what's it worth to, to save a life or whatever versus how much we actually have to spend. And what we end up trying to do is trying to, again, be data-driven in our approach to look for the locations where we can get the most bang for our buck in trying to reduce crashes, be it bicycle crashes or vehicle-vehicle <coughs> vehicle crashes or what have you. Um, it kind of goes back to that safety performance function that I was showing earlier, and I actually have another slide if, 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 if you want to see it real quick. While Joe's loading his slide, I'm just going to make a quick comment. Uh, as far as traumatic brain injuries, um, on the national level, it's well over a billion dollars taking care of people with head injuries. Um, and so that does get the government's attention. Uh, but at this point, only half the states have, a, less than half the states have a helmet law. So when we're looking at crashes, again, we've got, we would use this model to say, okay, here's the predicted number of crashes following this red line. If we have a location down here that has less crashes than you'd expect, we're probably not going to spend any time with that one. We're going to look at these that have more crashes than you'd expect based on the model. And those are the ones that probably, again, would give us the most bang for our buck and opportunity to make improvements. We can put dollar values to crashes based on severity levels. 
um, and that helps us try to determine whether the cost of the improvement, if there's a, you know, a benefit to cost ratio of, of doing it. But we don't like to try to get into, I mean, the cost of a life is, is obviously, you know, there's a lot more to it than just money. And so we try not to do that. But we do try to look at, you know, the costs of, of the, by the severity of the injuries as far as medical costs and things like that to try to at least get a ballpark of is it worth spending, you know, X dollars to save X dollars kind of a thing. Um, two things. Uh, first, I'd like to circle back to the, uh, the no lights on the bike uh, thing. I'm a bicycle ambassador and I give out plenty of lights and most people take them. Um, I give out an awful lot of them uh, after events in Old Town on summer evenings as the bikes are riding away and everything. Um, but an incident happened, I guess it was last summer. Uh, my wife and I came up on uh, a young lady on a bicycle and she had a carrier in the back with a child in the back. No lights. I think it was on Laporte Avenue heading west. And we pulled over and said, hey, you know, we always carry some lights with us, and here you go. And she said, oh, no thanks, and took off. So there's absolutely no logic. I mean, here's a person that you, it wasn't who we typically think of, somebody at, and I won't say it, but at Elizabeth and Laurel maybe, jumping curbs and all. This was a, a young lady with a baby in the back. It's like, okay. Anyway, uh, number two. There's a lot of folks up there that are data-driven, and I come from an area uh, east of the Mississippi, a very large community, and very few people ride bicycles. And when I moved out here, I found it to be pretty nice. Now, anecdotally, I think it's because a lot of people behind the wheel of a car also have a bicycle and use it. And I was wondering if there was any, any data that was ever collected because that would, that would uh, either, either say yes or no because then Joe's chart might change a little bit because it wouldn't be so much the number of cars on the road but as we educate people to become more aware and maybe to do a little more biking, would that curve change a little bit because now the person doesn't have to be on the bike the person just has to be a bicyclist, and would that help any? The chart is, is kind of a, just a snapshot in time. I mean, it, it's what we've got now based on looking at past data. It's always going to be evolving, and as people get, you know, as more and more people ride bicycles, I think there's benefit, even if just what you said, if they're not riding, they're still aware of it and they understand it. And so hopefully that chart will change over time for the better. And that's, again, that's kind of our goal, is not just to throw up our hands and say, oh, bike crashes are just going to increase. How do we change the chart is really our goal. Sort of back to the drinking and biking kind of thing. Has anybody looked at, like, really getting, I mean, people listen to New Belgium and Odell's. And if New Belgium and Odell's, you know, were involved in an education program, I mean, what better place to, like, you know, have stuff that the masses are going to see and, and are probably going to, in some little part of their mind, remember, you know, um, long term. I mean, you, you know, many of the, um, you know, there's little don't drink and drive things at the tail end of, 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 of commercials on television. Um, has any um, community that's sort of beer centric like us, uh, as it were, tried to really involve um, the breweries uh, in that community to sort of as 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 one avenue to get that message across. Um, the staff at at Odell's and at um, at all the breweries in town, New Belgium included, um, and and Hauser Busch, um, I think that they're all very cognizant and all trying to really push the safety message. I think, of course, they're focusing primarily on cars, but I think that's a fabulous idea to try to bring, you know, really coolify the safety message and really bring it home um, through those popular um, organizations. I Several years ago, the Bike Fort Collins is very involved with recruiting volunteers for Tour de Fat, and several years ago they asked for our feedback and saying what could you improve and I thought the one thing I would ask them to do 
is to require um, kids, like under a certain age, maybe 10 or under, or eight or under, to wear helmets in the bike parade. And that didn't really go anywhere, but I would still, like, maybe it, we're at the point now where we could revisit that and start, you know, they could, if anybody could make wearing a helmet cool, it would be New Belgium or Odell's. So, or one of the new breweries, um, or even one of the new um, whiskey bars. <laughs> so I think that there's a lot that we could do along those lines, and I'd like to investigate it, and I'm glad you brought that up. There has been, uh, the Tour de Fact director has been at some of the bike pedestrian m meetings and I think is aware of this. And in the Tour de Fat logo that was in the newspaper, they had their 10 rules of Tour de Fat. I think one of them was, you know, drink or ride responsibly. So I think it's there, but I just don't think it's emphasized quite enough. So I do agree with what you're saying. I don't know if anybody's seen that new... Um Oh, it's a YouTube video that Anheuser bought. It was a Coors or Anheuser Busch that put it out with the dog. With the, it's a teenager that gets a new puppy, and you watch the dog grow up with the guy. The guy walks out the door with a six pack with his buddies, and the dog longingly watches as his master goes away and doesn't come back. And the dog's sitting there like a day later, really sad. And then all of a sudden, the guy pops in the door and says, Hey, buddy, sorry I got you worried. I spent the night at my friend's house. I was drinking, and I didn't want to drive. And the whole, you know, I'm getting goosebumps when I think about the ad because it was so powerful and it's so all over YouTube and Facebook right now. So if, you know, that would be a great thing to come out with something like that, a message geared towards cyclists, and that would be so easy to do. Is there any work with bike-friendly businesses? Yeah, so there's there's been quite a bit of work with, with bike-friendly businesses. Um, we actually just had a press release that went out yesterday that announced, um, I believe it was seven new bicycle-friendly businesses that um, were ranked as part of this last um, League of American Bicyclists bike-friendly business program. Um, so that was pretty exciting. Fort Collins is, I think we're seventh in the nation in terms of the city with the most um, bicycle-friendly businesses. So that's, um, that's pretty good as well. Um, and a lot of this is being driven um, by the community, and um, Bevan Barber Campbell is actually one person that's been really influential in terms of working um, with different businesses around Fort Collins to try to get them to um, learn about the program and then provide some resources to them. But but yeah, it is it is something that um, is is a piece of the overall um, approach to increasing bicycling and making bicycling a viable option for for commuters um, in Fort Collins and something that we really hope to expand, um, not just with community organizations, but um, with partners within the city. So ClimateWise, for example, has a lot of reach into the, into the business community. And so that's something that we're looking at, um, kind of strengthening that partnership to, to get more businesses aware of that program. Um, I'd like to go ahead and wrap up to be respectful of the panel's time and, and the audience's time. Um, but what I thought I'd do is ask each of the panelists if they have any closing comments, if there's any reaction to anything that we talked about this evening. And then I'll just throw the group question out, my, my spur of the moment question that I didn't prep you for, is if you had the power what, and you could do one thing to improve the bicycling safety situation in Fort Collins today, what would it be? I guess that was a two-party question. One, do we have any closing comments? Um, I just think that the discussion was really good in your questions. I think we've done a lot of great work here, but I do think we have a long ways to go as well. And I think there's great collaboration from many, many individuals. And I know at the hospital level, we're very interested, um, not only here in Fort Collins, but also Denver, because now you know we're partnered with the University of Colorado. So they have a, a lot going down in Denver with the University Hospital as well along this area, as well as with Colorado Springs, because they're now part of our health system with the Olympic Training Center. So um, I think that we have a lot more to do as well. And then your impromptu question, uh, what can we do to save the safety of the cyclist? Um, I think we've talked about that. Uh, I'm really interested in the new protected bike lanes. Uh, I've kind of started the past couple years when I travel, I take pictures of bike lanes, both which ones I think are good and which ones I think are less effective. And so I, I'm excited to see that because, you know, there's, there's a lot of really interesting ways to protect bike lanes. Some are more expensive than others. So that would be what I would say. And I know that that's in our plan, so. Great. Thank you, Dr. Marty. Joe? You know, I just want to say thanks to everybody for being here tonight. I, it's, it's been a great discussion. Thanks to my co-panelists. I, I think it, 
you know, the knowledge in the room is fantastic, and it's exciting to me to see so much emphasis being put on bike safety. Um, as, as far as Mark's impromptu question, I think we've already touched on it tonight. You know, I spend a lot of time doing talks about traffic safety and how to avoid crashes and things like that, but we're just reaching just a, you know, a tiny percentage of the population, and it, it's not the people going to classes, it's not the people who are taking the time to be here tonight, it's, you know, the 150,000 people out there who aren't thinking about this every day, and if, you know, if we could figure out a way to reach them, the solutions aren't that hard, and a lot of it is just education. It's just getting that out in mass to people, and that's the thing that I'd like to see happen somehow. Thank you. Tessa? So, yeah, I would just echo the previous comments. I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here. Um, I think this is a really important um, and inspiring dialogue, and I think it's something that um, would be important to continue as, as we move forward, um, especially as we look to implementation of the bike plan. I think it's an ongoing discussion that we'll want to and need to have. Um, you know, there are a number of things. I, I think it's difficult to pick just one, but something that I'm really excited about, I mean, I think I think Fort Collins is at a point where we've reached, um, I'm, I'm assuming most of you have heard of the interested but concerned, um, the different categories of, um, of the transportation cycling population. Um, we've kind of reached a point where, um, you know, we've done a lot with bike lanes and now we need to kind of step into the next era. And I think there's a lot within this bicycle master plan, a lot of the things that um, we're kind of testing out there now with buffered bike lanes, the new um, dedicated bike signal. Um, I think a lot of this is still in testing and some of the things that we're proposing in the bike plan um, are, are demonstration projects. And so that's something that I think holds a lot of potential for Fort Collins as we continue to, to really look at these more innovative approaches that still need um, evaluation and still need that testing. And um, I think, you know, ultimately as we look toward 2020 with this plan, um, we'll be able to kind of look back and see what's worked and, and what hasn't worked um, in terms of improving safety and reaching kind of the new target um, audience. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And I think um, that, that does hold a lot of potential for increased safety. Thank you. Officer Case. Um, once again, uh, thank you guys for coming out and showing the interest because um, this is how we find out what's important to you. Um, I sit on my motorcycle or I sit in my police car or sit in my office. I don't, quite honestly, we don't get a lot of positive interaction with folks. Um, and so usually um, when, when I get to talk to somebody, it's at their car window and it starts with, I need your license, insurance, or registration. Um, so it's good to kind of kind of be able to sit and have a conversation without there being the automatic hostility that goes with that conflict. So thank you very much for taking the time to do that. Um, and not to counterman what Joe said, I'm going to ask you to go the opposite direction with the broadcast of our message. I don't want you to go speak to crowds of people. I want you to go talk to one on one. Talk to the people that you know, you work with, you love, you live with, you're in class with. Uh, because of the fact that I can stand in front of 100,000 people and I can tell you the stats that Dr. Marty pulled up and I can talk about intersections the way Joe drew them up and it's going to hit a small percentage. But when you go to the people you know, love and care about and you tell them, hey, this is how you can make yourself safer. This is, will, this is what will keep you from being in a crash. You become that ambassador for bicycle safety that we talk about um, because Who's going to listen to you more? Now, for those of you that are parents, you know your kids aren't listening, but your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, they're going to, that's the buy-in, okay? Um, and, you know, we, we hit on the statistics and we hit on um, the, the tragic numbers that we look at. Um, Robert E. Lee had, was quoted back during the Civil War. He said, a million deaths is simply a statistic, but a single death is a tragedy. Because if it's someone we know, someone we care about that we lose or that they're the ones who've been in the crash, it becomes much closer to home. There's that buy-in and people take it more to heart. So I, I ask you guys to go out into the community and be that ambassador. We don't need to give you a title. If you want a title, you're all blessed as bicycle ambassadors right now <laughs> via Dave. So go forth, do great things, guys. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Officer Kids. Bruce. So first of all, I'd echo thank you to everybody. This is great to get people uh, involved 
and asking questions and listening. It's really a super opportunity. It's one of the things that makes this community so great. Dave took my idea. I was going to make a similar plea to get involved, talk to people. So do that. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'll use this as an opportunity to say, uh, if I could spend an unlimited amount of money, we would build a lot of protected bike lanes with the appropriate intersection treatments to go with them, some Copenhagen-style treatments in the intersections, because that's where protected bike lanes kind of break down. But the idea is something that will physically particularly on our arterial roads, on roads that aren't safe for bicyclists today, really protect people, even regardless of how badly they want to ride. So that's it. Thank you. And Sylvia. So in closing, yes, thank you, for everyone, for being interested, engaged, and being here. And you know, I just want to say in the 28 years, I moved here 28 years ago, and in those years, I worked for the city for many years, promoting bike safety and working with businesses, encouraging um, alternative modes of transportation. But in the four years I moved away from 2006 to 2010, something really unique happened here. I came back and bicycling was all of a sudden this really cool thing to do. So many people were involved, so many people were out on the streets. And I, I think it was just this real paradigm shift that happened in those years that I was gone and I really noticed it when I got back and it hasn't changed since. So, you know, it took a while to build up to that, but it's now really moving full speed ahead and we're really grateful for that. Um, if I had a magic wand, um, I wouldn't do one thing, I'd do two things. So you can't stop me, Mark. <laughs> um, they're just, I'm, these, I'm very passionate about these issues. One of them is really trying to eliminate the animosity and the conflict between motorists and bicyclists. And you know, I mentioned some of the things that were, some initiatives that we're gonna be trying to do to help alleviate those. But that's very bothersome to me. It's very conflictual. It really divides the community. It divides bicyclists and it divides motorists among themselves. So that, and then, um, what was the other thing? Oh, it's so, pa so passionate about it. <laughs> um, um, I can't think of the other thing right now. I totally <laughs> lost it because I was so into that one. That's anyway, not a good thank sign, you. Sylvia. I know. <laughs> okay, this has been awesome. I can't, I can't thank you all enough. Could you do me a favor and give the panel a please? <laughs> and on behalf of the city's transportation board, I think we'll sign off for the evening. Thank you all very much for your help and your participation. Thank you all for coming out this evening.